All right, we will get the ball rolling here tonight. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Scallop webinar. My name is Ray Baudry. I'm the County Extension Director in Gulf County. Hope everyone is doing well out there. Hope you and your family are doing well during this difficult time. We're sure glad you're with us tonight. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, we have a packed agenda. Uh, so we'll have a few minutes for any kind of burning questions in between the talks. Um, but if you would, um, it'd be probably a good idea to keep those uh, questions maybe towards the end. Uh, we'll need to uh, have your volume muted as well as your video um, off during this time. Uh, but you can also, uh, you can type your questions into the chat box and uh, one of the moderators will be able to uh, read it when the time comes. There's gonna be also a poll that will start a little bit later in the program. Uh, be sure to watch out for, for that. Uh, one of our moderators is uh, Eric Lovestrand. He's our County Extension Director over in Franklin County. And he's also the Regional Specialized Agent for Sea Grant uh, in that area. Um, along with uh, tonight, we have Dr. Savannah Berry with us. She's a reg Regional Specialized Agent um, at our Nature Coast Biological Station uh, in Cedar Key. And she'll also be uh, discussing a uh, topic of seagrass this evening. We do have Shara Sharkey with us um, from FWRI, who's going to present a presentation on regional scallop uh, restoration efforts. And we also have Officer Ramos here, um, who's going to talk some recreational harvester uh, information and uh, how to stay safe uh, out on the waterway this scallop season. So I'm going to go ahead and kick things off tonight with a chat on our uh, volunteer scallop restoration program, better known as Scallop Sitter, uh, or Scallop Sitters. Uh, you probably heard about it, uh, but if not, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it tonight. Um, so with further ado, without further ado, we'll talk about the Scallop Sitter program. And this is a really a partnership between the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission and uh, UF IFAS extensions, Florida Sea Grant agents, really the natural resource agents in the Panhandle working together. FWC has really built the program, um, provided materials, supplies, uh, provided oversight um, where we extension agents and support staff really train and manage the volunteer network as well as the, manage the data. It's really a unique way to get community involved in restoring scallop populations in our area. Volunteers get their own scallops to place in the bay and care for, so the scallops can reproduce and therefore repopulate. Gulf and Bay counties were involved uh, in the program in 2018 and 19. Um, Franklin was Franklin County was a welcome addition in 2020. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we had to suspend the program this year, uh, but we are planning for next year, so let's keep our fingers crossed on that. Uh, so I wanted to take a couple of slides and just go over a little bit of an overview of uh, bay scallop biology. Uh, the genus and species is Argopectin irradians. Of course, they're bivalves. The super interesting thing about them is all the 40 plus eye blue eyes that are around the shell. Um, another thing that's really neat about them is they are a lot quicker uh, than you would think they would be. We'll play this video. Uh, as soon as they detect you with these, with the aid of these eyes, they are ready to get out of town. It's a pretty neat video. So they're very, very fast in the water uh, for their size. Um, there are also uh, a little bit about the anatomy of the bay scalp. They are hermaphrodites, so they do have both female and male uh, reproductive organs. Um, usually the shell size probably, uh, the largest height that you'll probably see here in the panhandle, uh, it's gonna be around three inches, but uh, for baked scallops, three and a half is, is probably the, the largest that you'll see anywhere. Um, of course, the abductor muscle that you see in the top of the diagram there uh, is the, the jewel that we're looking to consume, right? A little bit about uh, scallop uh, reproduction. 
The scallops are broadcast spawners. Um, that means they release sperm and eggs into the water where the eggs are then fertilized. Um, this about the, the larvae, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, the eggs and the sperm drift around about 10 to 14 days before they become larvae. Uh, and then eventually they'll, they'll develop into what's known as spat. And then the spat will eventually um, attach to seagrass where the scallop will begin its juvenile, really juvenile stages. Then the adult scallop will actually settle to the bottom. Um, generally, most scallops, the lifespan is somewhere between one and two years. So short-lived lifespan. Uh, scallops are filter feeders. Um, which means they open their shells and feed on particles of decayed plant matter and uh, phytoplankton that are trapped in the water waterway. Um, of course, we like to eat them, but there's a host of other creatures that dine on them as well. Octopus, uh, conchs, oyster drills, cow nose rays. Oh, and blue crabs and stone crabs can just pulverize the shells. Um, but it's a good thing that we do have seagrass there. Seagrass is so important. Um, it's a rich ecosystem for the scallop. It also helps them kind of camouflage there and uh, have a way to combat predation. So yeah, seagrass habitat is, is, a, is a huge plus. Uh, seagrass is a huge uh, plus for scallop habitat. Savannah is going to talk a little bit more about seagrass in her presentation. Uh, because, scallop feeder, uh, because scallops filter feed and use their gills to absorb oxygen from water. Scallops need some really good water quality to be able to thrive. Um, and so we utilize these gills to do so. This is actually a photo um, uh, from one of our scallops that we're, so that's pretty neat. Uh, so they need really good water quality, somewhere between 20 and 35 parts per thousand. Um, it's a good range for the salinity. Uh, temperatures between 50 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit is also a good target. Um, probably the most optimal temperature for the water is going to be 70 degrees. Um, but of course there are threats um, to scallops in our bays. Uh, red tide blooms, which are, you know, naturally occurring algal species um, often are the source for these red tide um, events. But uh, there is pollution issues from stormwater that can cause problems. Uh, large rainfall events that can uh, change the salinity into more fresh or brackish water is an issue. And of course, when we have our occasional, um, we have our occasional storms that really store up sediment, that uh, also is a problem uh, uh, with turbidity. So they need really clear water. Uh, this is just a picture of a hydrometer, which is a device that scallop sitters use to measure salinity. Talk more about that in just a second. Uh, but the big thing are predator exclusion cages. So in 2017, um, FWC had a novel idea to transfer scallops to these predator exclusion cages in St. Joe Bay. And what a great job they did. Um, the expected goal from the effort was that the holding scallops in cages will add a level of protection, protection from predators, therefore increasing offspring produced and help us to further restore scallops in bays. So in 2018, not only did FWC continue this effort, but volunteers began, began participating in the Scallop Sitter program as well. And I've got some pretty interesting data about that. So you may be asking yourself, well, what is a Scallop Sitter? What are the kind of supplies that a Scallop Sitter would use? Well, you, you don't have to live on the coast. You don't have to own property on the coast to be a Scallop Sitter because there are dock cages and bay cages that you can see in this illustration. Um, so these are the predator exclusion cages um, that are used. Um, a, a scallop sitter will also get a hydrometer to measure salinity, an oyster knife, rope, float if it's a bay cage, a brick to help keep the cage on the bottom, a bucket and a lid to help uh, aid in cleaning the scallops, uh, gloves and a scrub brush. Um, it's great to have these locations and areas, these cages and locations where there's not a lot of boat traffic. Uh, it's really convenient, convenient area to get to by boat or kayak or wading. 
and we always want to mark those GPS points. Uh, but what a scallop sitter does is they go out once a month, visit the cage, take a salinity measurement, note any kind of mortality, and clean the scallops because there's generally going to be some barnacles or some uh, unsavory things growing on those, uh, those scallops. Um, here's a slide, just an illustration of of the cage locations that have been in St. Joseph Bay and St. Andrews Bay over the last couple of years. Since the cages are generally throughout the entire bay, this has really helped us kind of pinpoint, you know, site suitability as far as salinity measurements and how salinity, what the natural salinity is in these areas and where are the best spots to put these cages. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we've, we've put the cages over this time. Uh, as far as our scallop sitters go, they do a monthly maintenance program. Um, try to clean the scallops and take a salinity measurement, like I said. Uh, first of the week of every month um, is what we, what we strive for. Um, I really want to look at the number of live scallops that are left, as well as the salinity. We really try to make this a community effort, get everybody involved. Get on. We have a Facebook page, too, where we do a lot of communication. Our volunteers um, those pictures and there's a lot of interaction there so it's a really great thing to uh, build community ca capacity. Just a couple of slides about some of the results. So St. Joseph Bay uh, restoration progress. So this is sort of a comparison of the monthly maximum scallop numbers and predator uh, exclusion cages. So when FWC was doing their research um, to begin with in 17, we had a little over 2,100 uh, scallops that were counted in those cages. Uh, in 2018, um, with our uh, initial scallop sitter program started in, in Gulf County, we had, a little, we had over 16,000 scallops that were counted in those cages. Of course, Hurricane Michael came along and wrecked some things for us, unfortunately, but it was a really good start to the year otherwise. Some of the impacts that we had from the project last year in 2019 um, for both St. Joseph and St. Andrews Bay, you can say we had, see we had 200 cages that were maintained by volunteers, um, about three times as much in St. Andrews Bay uh, than we did in St. Joe Bay. Uh, but each volunteer had 50 scallops that they split 25 in, in two different cages. And so that roughly had 5,000 scallops maintained for by volunteers. And greater than 400 volunteer hours of service that year, which was just spectacular. Um, some lessons learned really quickly. Um, water's too fresh, especially in St. Andrews Bay. It's been a real challenge. Site suitability issues have been there in Bay County. Um, I'm trying to restore scout populations there. We're still really working on that year to year. Um, we did start off by using some smaller scallops, um, but they were really harder to care for and a lot of times the shells broke so we use uh, larger adult scallops. Now we still have some issues with poaching from time to time and that may just be part of this. Um, that's a little bit of a downer um, but we've also had some better cage design over the time over the two years too uh, especially as far as new foot development for the cages so they don't move around as much on the bottom um, and we kind of streamlined our data management as well so Lessons learned and things are definitely uh, on the uptick. But uh, just some pictures of some scallop sitters um, in the last couple of years. Um, been a really fun project. Um, project usually begins somewhere uh, in June and July and lasts until December. Um, so join us next year. Hopefully we'll have the ability to restart the program in 2021. Um, You'll see updates from us in various websites. There'll be a media blitz definitely um, for it. Um, so with that, if I, had, if I have any burning questions at this point, if not, we'll wait till the end. Don't see any questions coming in so far, Ray, so I think we're good to move on. You should have control. All right, wonderful. Well, thanks so much, everyone, 
Jasmine for being here this evening and um, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about seagrass and how it, it intersects with our scallop habitats. Uh, let's see, there we go. All right, so, oops, I went too far. There was a bit of a lag, sorry everybody. Just bear with me a second. All right, so this is what we're all after. These, um, this is a picture I took, man, there's a really a bad lag. <laughs> This is a picture I took in Homosassa, and it was one of the very first sites I saw when I came to Florida. I'm originally from Virginia, and I fell in love at this point, and I'm sure you are all here because you have fallen in love with the same thing, or you're interested in trying to experience what it is that people get so excited about when it comes to scalloping. But while all of you are probably focusing on those little Easter eggs that are nestled in the seagrass, I have spent most of my career looking at all that green stuff around the scallops. Uh, and so this is seagrass. And when we say seagrass, we're talking about um, plants that are living fully submerged in salt water. And this is a really special thing that seagrasses can do. They are, uh, there are only about 2% of plants on, in the whole plant kingdom that can deal with salt in this way. And so it's a really special adaptation that they have. Uh, they're fully flowering plants with roots and rhizomes, and that picture there in the middle of your slide is of a, a turtle grass flower. And um, the closest land plant relative of seagrasses is actually the lily. So they're not related to the type of grass that grows in your lawn at all, which means they don't like to be mowed, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, similar to scallops, they also require really good water quality, meaning they need plenty of light in order to grow and survive. Since they're rooted to the bottom, anything that causes shading or reduces the, the amount of light reaching the bottom is going to be a problem for seagrasses. And I just wanted to highlight really quickly the two main types of seagrass that you probably will see when you're out scalloping. We have seven species of seagrass in Florida, but these are the, pretty much the two big ones here on the right. The top one is manatee grass or Syringodium filiforme, and it's a cylindrical bladed seagrass. It's kind of like chives or green onions in its leaf structure. And then the other one is turtle grass, and that's that flat strap bladed grass, and it's, and it's the most dominant one that you'll see in St. Joe Bay. Okay, so seagrass has a lot of functions. Most people inherently know that it creates habitat, right? I mean, it, it creates structure in a mud flat or area that otherwise would be pretty bare and structureless. And so that's very intuitive. And I picked this picture here of a little baby scallop settling down on the seagrass blades. And we're here to talk about scallops, but there are a multitude of other species that depend on seagrass. It's about 85% of our recreational and commercially important species depend on seagrass for part of their life cycle. So, um, but they're doing a lot of other really cool things for us too. They, they're out there increasing the water clarity and making it nicer for us to snorkel around in and find those scallops. And that also makes it nicer for the scallops. They like to be in waters that have low sediment loads and, and high clarity. And seagrasses do that by trapping and stabilizing the sand and making it harder for the bottom to get stirred up. So that's another thing that they're out there doing. They're also capturing a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and they're releasing a lot of oxygen into the water uh, for all those critters to breathe. And then of course, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but they do contribute, in my opinion, a lot of aesthetic beauty to an area and they of course support a lot of recreational activity and some of our favorite species like turtles and manatees um, also can be seen in seagrass flats. And we're lucky in Florida and that we have a ton of seagrass. We have the two largest seagrass meadows in, the, in North America, just right here in our state. And that's Florida Bay is the biggest one. And the second largest one is in the Big Bend or the Nature Coast region, which is actually where I'm based. But St. Joe Bay actually has a lot of seagrass as well. And historically there was more seagrass in the Panhandle than there is now, but there are a lot of efforts to restore seagrasses. And a lot of the scallop restoration efforts that Ray just talked about are going to be dependent on the mutual success of seagrass restoration as well. Um, so we do have a lot of it, but unfortunately it's very threatened. Seagrasses are some of the most threatened habitats that we have. And um, the two leading impacts are water quality and decline in light. 
Uh, so anything that reduces light, again, like I said earlier, is going to be a problem for seagrasses. And we're all too familiar with problems like nutrient enrichment that lead to algal blooms and coastal development that leads to siltation and lots of sediment or turbidity being in the water. Um, and th that is overall the largest problem for seagrasses. But there is another really you know, important and unfortunately growing problem for seagrasses in Florida, and that is physical damage through prop scars and anchors. Um, there are lots of other threats, but these are the two main ones, and we're going to be focusing on physical damage for the rest of the talk because this is actually something that you and me and every other boater can do our part to prevent. It's a lot harder to solve our state's water quality problems. There's a lot of great, smart people working on that, and we do all have our role to play there as well. But you can directly prevent physical damage to seagrass, and we're just going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so to give you a closer look at the problem, I took a snapshot from Google Earth, and it's really hard to see depending on the contrast settings on your computer. So I went ahead and traced over all of the scars in this area. So this was taken off of Taylor County, um, is, which is another popular scalloping area. And in just this nine acre area, we've got 2,600 linear feet of prop scars. And even that red one is actually actively being created as this satellite is taking this image, which is kind of an interest. That's why I picked the screenshot actually, because uh, unfortunately you could take a lot of um, screenshots like this. I don't know why my slides keep going forward. I'm not clicking them forward. Sorry. All right, some technical difficulties here. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, so basically you probably already read what it said on the slide. This is a problem because prop scars are extremely costly to restore. So um, we would never actually spend this money to restore see these prop scars because it's just way too much money. But we're missing out on a lot of services. Every little square foot of seagrass that's lost is um, you know, some more of those services that we're missing out on, and it would be really expensive to try to put it back. Okay, so there's lots of other reasons why scarred seagrass other than the cost of po possible restoration. Um, most people don't realize how long it actually takes a prop scar to heal naturally, and it's usually at least a year, and that's in the best case. If you're in waters that have a lot of currents or if you have a lot of storms, or tidal um, exchange, you can actually see scars scour out and expand rather than heal naturally. And if you have a grass flat that's got a lot of scars across it, it's actually less resilient and more vulnerable to being lost if we have a storm roll through or something like that. And seagrass scars degrade the habitat quality. Overall, they make it easier for predators to come in and attack the little critters that are trying to hide in the seagrass. So I guess it depends on who you are if you think it's a degradation of your habitat. Uh, for all the little critters, it's a degradation, but for the predators, it actually makes it better for them, I guess. So it, it again, it depends on your viewpoint, but it's creating an edge in a habitat that wouldn't otherwise have an edge, at least not a, a linear straight edge like that. Uh, it can also damage your boating equipment and cause really costly uh, repairs that you might need to make to your prop or your skeg or even your whole lower unit. And also scars are just kind of a bummer, you know, they're just unsightly reminders of all the negative ways that we can impact our coastline. And because they're preventable, it just kind of stinks when you're out there and you see that the grass is getting all torn up. And if you've been boating in St. Joe Bay, you know, and if you haven't, you will find out when you go boating there, there is a lot of very shallow water in St. Joe Bay. Um, and areas like that. So um, throughout the whole nature coast actually. So it's actually easy to make a scar if you don't plan ahead or know the steps to avoid them. All right, so how can we avoid scarring seagrass? Uh, first of all, we can avoid seagrass when possible. We can use navigational channels and go and boat in deep water and only transit over the grass flats for the minimum possible distance or amount of time that we need to. Another thing that goes with this is not only avoiding seagrass in the path that we're traveling, but also avoiding seagrass by knowing what the water depth is going to be and planning your trip around the tides. Trying not to be boating too much at the lower tides um, can really help you avoid contacting the bottom. 
when you are boating over seagrass, which if you're going scalloping, you probably will be, um, trim up your motor and, or even use your trolling motor when you're over seagrass, especially if it's really shallow. Keep an eye behind you. And if you're seeing mud and little uh, leaves getting stirred up, that's a surefire sign that your motor is impacting the bottom and you need to slow down and trim up um, or even use a push pole. And if you do find yourself aground on seagrass, it happens to the best of us. Um, the best thing to do is actually turn off your motor, lift it out of the water, put on something to protect your feet and push your boat off of the grass flat. If you attempt to power off, uh, reverse or forward with your motor, not only is that gonna increase your risk of damaging your motor, it's also gonna cause an even worse type of seagrass damage than a scar. It's gonna cause what we call a blowout. And so, um, a blowout is not going to really ever heal on its own and it's going to require a lot of costly repairs. It basically creates a deep hole and trench in the seagrass in that area. So those are the basic steps. And um, the other thing I wanna point out is if nothing else I said so far matters to you, it also is important to know that seagrass protection is the law in aquatic preserves, which there is one in St. Joe Bay and also throughout most of the nature coast and scalloping grounds is that there is actually an up to a $1,000 fine for damaging seagrass within an aquatic preserve. And that again is because of all of the important functions that they do for all of us. And I just have one last slide here just to let you know about some actions you can take today. And the first one is to take a seagrass safe boating pledge. And um, it might seem like a kind of a silly thing, but actually a lot of research shows that if you just take one second to take a pledge and label yourself as a seagrass safe boater, then you actually will consider seagrass and take that into account more in the future. And we'll share that link with all of you in the chat and also in the follow-up email. And then we also have a star scalloper pledge that's a little bit broader and covers a lot of scalloping best practices that you can apply to help contribute towards the sustainability of the uh, resource in general and also the safety of the scallop fishery, which is another really important topic. So um, feel free to put any questions you may have in the chat. And um, other than that, I guess I can hand it back over. Then I do see one question that has come up in the chat, and okay, anybody on the panel could probably answer this. Sarah may even have some information related to this. And the question was, does the dark water coming from the intercoastal waterway that comes into St. Joseph Bay hinder seagrass and scallop development? So it's basically a just a tannic form of water that comes down that waterway and into St. Joe Bay. Yeah, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the system as some of the ones closer to me, but I, there is, if it's something that impacts the amount of light that reaches the bottom, which certainly tannins in the water can, then that would negatively impact seagrasses. Um, and so if it's blocking the light, then yeah, that would have, um, that would definitely have an impact. I'm not sure what the salinity quality of that uh, would be. So it, I guess it depends on if it's very fresh, then it could also be negatively impacting both the seagrass and the scallops. Um, somebody, so, and then we have a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just to follow up on that, somebody popped in another question that said that it's not just tannins, it does have a sediment load with it too, so. Okay, yeah, so it's definitely very possible. Um, so another question from Kelly is, what is the proper method for discarding scallop shells? And I'm not sure if anyone else is gonna cover this, but um, basically we wanna make sure that you're not, after you shuck your scallops, that you're not disposing of the guts and the shells in marinas, uh, boat slips, channels, uh, swimming areas, any, any place where they could either fill in areas where people need to boat or impact swimmers by cutting people's feet. So the best thing to do is either shuck your scallops out in the open water and return those shells right out into the open gulf. You are allowed to land scallops uh, as uh, shucked meat, so that's one option. You could also uh, just 
put the shells in the gut straight in the trash. That's definitely an option too. And then another way you could use them is a lot of people have found them to be great for craft projects or used in place of mulch even out in your garden, um, kind of bring a Florida flare to your yard. And then I've even heard people say they fill potholes in their road with them and stuff like that. So just as long as they're not going into marinas, swimming areas or channels, then, um, then you should be in good shape. All right, and can we take one more before moving on or how are we doing? Okay, so we have we do have one more. And I'll just take this one before we move on. It, it's uh, could they just dredge out a straight line for boaters in areas of seagrass and then kayakers only in their remaining areas from henceforth to avoid more prop strikes. So this is a, an interesting idea. I mean, a lot of the navigational channels we have are already dredged um, in some cases through seagrasses. So uh, that that idea is, is definitely out there. I wouldn't see there being much of an option for making new channels through seagrass flats in that way. Um, but the the second part of the of the point about having kayakers only or maybe no no combustion motors is definitely a management technique that's been applied in other areas in Florida, Everglades National Park. There are several county parks in Pinellas County. We call these no motor zones or um, pole and troll zones is another way to refer to them. And for areas that are getting heavily damaged and other management actions like education or uh, law enforcement haven't been able to solve the problem, excluding propeller driven motors from an area is certainly a management option that could be pursued um, for areas based on needs. So I hope that answers the question. I'd be happy to answer it in more detail during the Q&A session. Okay, well, if that's all the questions for now, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Sarah Sharkey, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator of the East Point Scallop Crew at the FWC's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. And today I'm going to be discussing some of the restoration efforts that are underway for the Bay Scallop and the Florida Panhandle. It looks like there's a lag for me too, so. So first, um, let's take a look at the, a brief history of the bay scallop fishery in the panhandle. Um, in the eastern Gulf of Mexico, the bay scallop once supported an important commercial fishery in Florida. Um, it extended from Florida Bay to Pensacola, and this graph shows bay scallop pounds harvested um, began to decline in the 60s. Um, so in 1994 was when the commercial fishery was actually closed and it hasn't reopened since that time. Um, possible causes to that decline were habitat loss, diminished water quality, overfishing, or recruitment failure, and it's probably a combination of all of those, but it's not all bad news because we decided to start working on a restoration project for bay scallop populations in the Florida Panhandle. And the goal of the project is to increase depleted scallop populations in um, particular bays in the panhandle, such as St. Andrews and St. Joe, um, and reintroduce scallops in other suitable areas like Pensacola Bay. Um, this work is funded through a natural resource damage assessment grant, and it started in 2016, so we've been working at it since then. Um, like I said, the restoration project kicked off in 2016. Um, and it started with an effort focused on St. Joseph Bay. Um, in 2018, we expanded our efforts to include St. Andrews Bay. Um, in 2019, we expanded further into St. George Sound, which is in Franklin County. And in 2020, we're currently working on expanding our restoration efforts for bay scout populations into Pensacola Bay. So although these efforts have been in a staggered fashion, the goal is the same in each bay. We're trying to increase the bay scallop population across the Panhandle Bays. And here's how we're making those restoration goals a reality. We have two methods of restoration. Um, let's wait for the sketch up. Okay. 
So one of the restoration efforts we undertake is through the collection of wild spat. And spat are essentially just baby scallops. Um, we collect these wild spat from our restoration areas using spat traps, which are shown here. Um, they're essentially just a citrus bag attached to a cement block. The citrus bag has a donut float attached to the top so that the traps will float and spat can flow through them and there's water flow. Um, there's a block at the bottom and it has a large buoy attached so that we can easily recapture these traps when we need to. And within the citrus bag, there's a pl plastic mesh for the spat to settle on. And as the spat settle into the citrus bags, they can continue to grow in there and they're perfectly happy and we can collect them when we're able to. Um, and in the picture on the right, you can see that the spat traps fill up with lots of scallops and they're, they also fill up with a lot of dirt, but the scallops are perfectly happy in there. So the other restoration method we undertake is we work with a hatchery, the Bay Shellfish Company, to provide spat and larvae to bolster our restoration efforts. We collect the broodstock in the Panhandle Bays to support a spawning event within a hatchery setting each summer. And in the fall, the hatchery provides us with thousands of scallop larvae and spat. And at that point, we release the larvae into the bays and we raise spat in their bay of origin for release and other restoration efforts. Um, the broodstock scallops on the left are used to produce the very tiny larvae on the right. And the hope is that these larvae will settle into the seagrass where they are released and grow into healthy adult scallops and spawn and continue the cycle. So not all of the larvae are released directly into the wild. In some cases, we raise them in cages and you'll see those restoration cages in a minute. So after all the spat had been collected through both wild and hatchery methods, the scallop crew takes care of thousands of these baby scallops in cages throughout the bays. Um, each, well, pretty much every two weeks we go out there and clean all of the spat and we sort them into different size classes on a regular basis. So the spat that are growing faster can be with their counterparts and we make sure that their density is not getting too high. And as the spat continues to grow out, we continue to keep them clean and their cages clean. Um, throughout the process, these spat live in small mesh bags inside scallop sitter sized cages, which you saw earlier in Ray's presentation. Once the scallops reach the adult size, we are able to place them into larger restoration cages, which are three feet by three feet in cages in the bays. And these cages sit on top of those aluminum um, racks that you see on the left-hand side. Um, and they're anchored to the seafloor, so they aren't going anywhere. And all the cages are labeled with do not disturb labels in the hopes that anyone who finds them inadvertently will leave them alone. But we have had a few um, poaching issues in the past. But with all of these scallops in one place, um, the hope is that the spawning will occur and it'll be more successful because all the scallops are together. And the obvious question is why would holding all the scallops together produce more offspring? And we'll take a closer look um, at each of the sites in the wild. A lot of these are low density scallop populations. So there's a low chance of successful fertilization occurring because of their broadcast spawning methods. Um, unfortunately, the density of wild scallops in these bays is pretty low, which is why we're making the effort to restore each of these populations. And with that, the chances of reproductive reproductive success on a wide scale for these wild populations is pretty low. Not only that, the wild scallops are somewhat susceptible to predation that would prevent them from spawning at all. So when the scallops are placed in cages, they're protected from predation, as we mentioned, and wild scallops, since they are at a greater risk of predation, that's a big deal. But not only that, they're able to be in close proximity to each other while in these cages. So when they are able to spawn, they increase their chances of producing a successful offspring with other scallops close by. And our goal is to keep a large enough number of scallops protected in these predator exclusion cages in each bay that we're working in so that they can 
have a successful spawning event. So here's an overview of our scallop restoration efforts in the past Oops. and our, our plans for this year. So in 2016, we began our restoration efforts in St. Joe Bay. And in 2018, we kicked off the community based restoration projects. One of those was the scallop sitter program, which Ray discussed earlier. And the second was scallop rodeo events in which um, members of the community came out and helped us gather scallops for these restoration cages before the season started. So those scallops and cages were protected from being pulled out during the season. And in 2019, we began to implement our plan for larval releases and we would take scallops from each bay, have them spawned at the hatchery and then bring the larvae back for release later. This year, we're planning to expand our restoration efforts to include Pensacola Bay, and we're increasing our efforts in St. George Sound. So it's been a busy year for the scallop crew. And here's a look at the numbers for St. Joe Bay. Uh, the main takeaway is that these densities are really variable. As you might recall, last year's scallop season was a really outstanding year, but the years leading up to that presented low but growing densities, and we expect there to be big swings back and forth for now. And with so much effort being put into the restoration of these scallop populations, we make sure to take the time to conduct adult population monitoring surveys each year to measure our progress towards restoration goals. We conduct these surveys to measure the density of scallops at sites where we've been working to restore scallops diligently. And we swim 100 meter transect at stations where they They've been randomly selected throughout the bay within numbered grid boxes, which you can see on the right hand map. And we count the number of scalps that we encounter and we measure any shell heights of the scalps that we find. And this information is just giving us a better idea of how scallop populations are faring in the bays in a given year because it does change so much from year to year. And in the past, we've also collected conducted um, these surveys during the areas open to scalloping prior to the season starting. In this chart you can see the data from preseason surveys from 2012 through 2019 in the open areas. However, this year we were we decided to switch to conducting surveys after the scallop season closes instead of prior to the opening of the scallop season. One of the big reasons for choosing to do this is because scallops spawn in the early fall typically a little bit after the scallop season closes each year. So by sampling in the fall, we can evaluate the scallops that are available to spawn, which will directly support the fishery following the next year. So the data we collect in the fall can show us a larger overall trend for the next year and see changes in the spawning stock and very useful to assessing the health of the overall population and the resiliency of the space scallop throughout its range. And this year, there's going to be four main zones that have different season start and end dates. And since you guys are in Gulf County, the season is going to start open on August 16th, which is this Sunday, and it'll run to September 24th. And this region includes all the state waters from Mexico Beach Canal all the way to Bay County, um, the western point of St. Vincent Island in Franklin County. And scalping is a really fun activity for everyone pretty much in the summer, but I would like everyone to stay careful in the summer. Um, so a few ways to stay safe while you're scalloping include make sure to put up your dive flag to protect yourself while you're in the water. It's a really simple thing to do, but it can really make a big difference. And as you're making your way throughout the bay, please be careful of the seagrass like Savannah mentioned earlier. Propellers can really do a lot of damage and damaging the scallop habitat isn't helpful if you want to collect more scallops next year. So, and we did cover this a little bit, but we ask that you don't discard scallop shells in inshore waters that are used for recreational activities like swimming because piles of shells can be a sharp hazard to swimmers and it could damage seagrass habitat as well. So if you can take those shells to the trash or you could recycle them into crafts or yard decorations. And finally, try to keep your trash out of the bay while you're 
out and about on the water this scallop season. And I also wanted to take a moment to clarify the gallon limits for bay scallops because I see a lot of confusion when I'm at the ramps with scallopers. Um, for most five gallon buckets, like the kind that you'll pick up at the store, um, the five gallon mark isn't actually the top of the bucket, but it's a little bit within the bucket, like closer to the bucket handle. So in this picture, the scallopers kind of, they technically collected more than their 10 gallon limit. Um, you can buy some five gallon buckets that have the mark already on it for the five gallon limit. But if you don't have that, maybe try filling up your bucket with five gallons and then making a line yourself. Um, and I wish you all a very happy <laughs> galloping season. Um, and as you might know, you might see us around. The Scallop Crew conducts harvest monitoring surveys each year. Um, last year, we conducted seven aerial surveys to count scalloping vessels throughout the season. And we conducted several boat ramp interviews on the days that we conducted aerial surveys. And we conducted around 500 interviews and counted over 1400 boats on the water. So scalloping is definitely a popular season. And here's a closer look at the information that we were able to gather from those um, surveys. So most of the scallopers are from Florida, but 16% that we interviewed were from other states, predominantly Georgia and Alabama. And from the state of Florida, around two dozen counties show up in um, Gulf County for the scallop season. That's just something to be aware of while you're out on the water. And on the days that we were able to conduct interviews last year, um, around 40 5,000 scallops were taken out each day, and most scallopers were hitting their limits. So 2019 was a really fun and successful season. So I hope that 2020 is just as good for you guys. And thanks for listening. I think we're holding questions to the end, but you can shoot me an email if you think of anything after the webinar at sarah.sharkey at myfwc.com. Thanks. All right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, looks like we did have a question here. Um, do you have an estimate of the scallop populations in St. Joe Bay this summer? I think you're muted. Let me unmute you. Hey, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, we don't have a particular estimate, but based on what we've been seeing, I think it'll be lower than last year. So, you never know. Oh. Okay, there was another question about the May-June transect count, too. Um, would that be a similar... We answer? didn't conduct preseason surveys this year, so... Okay, no preseason survey. Okay. All right, I will uh, turn it over now to um, Officer Ramos. Um, I've got a slide up for him, uh, giving you some information on the rec uh, recreational scallop fisheries regulations for this year. Um, but with that, I'll let him um, take it over. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Officer Bobby Ramos uh, with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. I'm currently over here in Pensacola, Florida. Um, that's where I'm home based out of. But I'm very familiar with St. Joe Bay and the scalloping industry and, and can talk about that just a little bit. I'll probably cover a few points that Sarah or, or Samantha may have already covered, so bear with me if I repeat some of the same information. But in general, the, the Gulf County season will open up on August 16th and remain open through September 24th. Uh, Sarah already discussed the, you know, where those open waters are going to be up for Gulf County. For more information regarding scalloping from FWC's perspective, you can go onto our website, click on recreational regulations, and underneath base scallops, um, underneath the crab, shrimp, and shellfish tab. But I'm going to give you the highlights of that information here uh, as well. Uh, just like you see on the slide before you, our bag limit in Gulf County will be two gallons of whole scallop or one pint shuck per person per day or an aggregate vessel limit of 10 gallons whole or a half gallon shucked, um, which is four pints. 
Uh, one thing that our officers will be looking for is what we call double tripping or triple tripping. So when we talk about a bag limit per day, that's exactly what that is. If, whether you go out in the morning or you go out in the afternoon, once you have your daily bag limit, please don't make a second trip. Um, we have officers who are plain clothes and looking for these kind of violations. And if you're caught doing that, you will receive a criminal citation and you'll get to go talk to the judge about why you're not abiding by the law. As far as um, how you take scallops out of the wild, you can do that via a hand or a dip net. And then recreational harvesters do have to have a Florida saltwater fishing license to harvest your base scallops unless you fall into some of the exemption criteria. If you do, you, you probably know what that is. You can use the shoreline fishing license and wade into the water and pick them up as long as you're not actually snorkeling or scuba diving in order to harvest those scallops. Um, for those who may not be familiar with the bay, there are um, multiple access points that are shallow enough uh, where you can just walk out into the bay. And we, we used to use the term called hogging them up, basically walking along. You can you know, either see them when the water clarity is there, or sometimes you feel them underneath your feet and you're able to uh, harvest scallops that direction. Um, Boating safety, and this is something that I would definitely like to um, emphasize, the importance of boating safety while you're out on the waters, not just in St. Joe Bay, but anywhere in our wonderful state. If you're gonna be using a, either snorkel equipment or um, scuba diving equipment, you are required by law to display a diver's down device. Most often we call this a diver's flag. And it's a big red tri or uh, rectangle with a white diagonal line in the middle of it. There are specific dive flag requirements. Again, you can get that information from our website, but in essence, make sure that you've got that flag hoisted up above the top uh, of the vessel, at the highest point of the vessel, so that everybody else around you can see it from 360 degrees. And then when you're actually out scalloping or scuba diving and you have your um, flag displayed, uh, every boat out there needs to stay outside the 300 feet of that dive flag if they're going to be up on plane. If you are coming within 300 feet of a displayed dive flag, um, you have to come down to idle speed in order to pass um, through that section. There are areas in the bay over there where you're going to have boat upon a boat upon a boat, and there might be ex you know situations where you're going to have to be in idle speed for quite some time. Please do that because the last thing you want to do is, um, you know, unintentionally hit somebody and ruin your life, ruin their life over being in a hurry to get out there. Those scallops, I know Ray said they're fast swimmers, but they're not that fast. So <laughs> take your time, get out there and enjoy the day, okay? Um, other things with our dive flag, um, like I said, uh, if, if you're having a flag out, you stay within 300 feet of your flag. And if you're in a vessel, you stay 300 feet away from somebody else's flag. If you can't maintain that 300 foot distance, come down to idle speed, please. Our officers will also be conducting regular boating and resource inspections on everybody out there. Make sure you're up to date on all boating regulations and requirements. The one thing that an officer is never going to forgive is not having sufficient life jackets or what we call a PFD on board. That's a personal flotation device of a proper size fitting uh, for everybody on the vessel. So if you've got four adults on the boat, you need to have four adult life jackets. If you have an infant or a toddler, you have to have an infant um, life jacket on that baby you know, while the vessel's in motion and so on and so forth. So please you know, take a few moments ahead of your trip go through your safety equipment and make sure that you are meeting all the safety standards for the U.S. Coast Guard requirements. Other things, um, like we've alluded to, when you're out there on the waters of the bay, uh, there could potentially be a lot of people in the water, a lot of vessels. Um, it's very, very important to constantly scan your surroundings while you're operating a boat. Um, those who are experienced with operating a boat understand the importance of doing a 360 degree scan while you're not just in the water, but while you're operating your boat as well. Um, there's not lanes out there in the bay. So vessel traffic could come at you from behind, from the sides, from all different directions. So again, please slow down, look around 360, maintain you know situational awareness um, so that there are no accidents out there. Once you are done scalloping or diving, 
please take your dive flag down. Do not drive around the bay with your dive flag hoisted up or you probably will be stopped by an officer. And just finally, a few best practices when you're out and about, uh, we always recommend that you snorkel with a buddy. You know, have somebody that's out there with you to, you, know, you watch your back, they watch your back. Um, if you're underwater, you know, whether you're scalloping or, or snorkeling or scuba diving and you hear a boat motor coming by, take an opportunity to stand up real fast and just make sure that boater sees you. Quite often the water that you're harvesting scallops from will be super shallow, maybe two, three feet deep, or, or sometimes shallower, sometimes deeper. If you can stand up and just let that boater know that you're out there, um, take an opportunity to do that and just make it a little bit safer. Um, also be aware of any kind of changing tides and inclement weather. You know, our Florida waters are beautiful, but uh, you also understand that in Florida, the weather could change very, very rapidly. And should some poor weather roll in, you want to make sure you can get back to the boat ramp safely and expeditiously and uh, without having any issues. And finally, the last thing we'll ask for you is to be courteous of one another um, at the boat ramp and on the waterways. Understand that there may be folks out there who are, you know, recreational scalloping for the very first time, may have very limited to no boater experience whatsoever. And you may be a seasoned veteran and ready to do your thing. And you might be four or five deep at the boat ramp trying to get out there. Um, let's just be careful and let's just be courteous to each other. Um, if you are putting your vessel in the water at a boat ramp, please make all your preparations um, before you actually back down to the ramp. So, and just observe good etiquette and let other folks who might be more prepared and ready to get in slide in front of you if it's gonna take you a little bit longer. Um, overall, you know, um, just be courteous to each other. If you have questions, you know, FWC uh, biologists like Sarah will be available. Our officers are always available, flag us down. Um, if you see violations occurring, anything that we discuss, you can call it into our FWC dispatch um, and just pound FWC is an easy way to get, ne get connected with us. And uh, we'll do everything we can to come out there and uh, address any violations. And I think um, that will do it for me, Mr. Ray. Well, thank you so much, Officer Robles. That's great information. I tell you what, let's, uh, if we can hang around for just a few minutes, we'll see uh, if we have any more questions that come in the text box. Um, and Ray, if you're ready, I can also go ahead and launch the poll for everybody to go ahead and take. That would be great. All right, so everyone, you should be seeing a poll come up on your screen. And if you could just take a few minutes, we'll leave this open and give you time to answer some questions and give us some feedback today. And in the meantime, after you finish the poll, you can go ahead and type your questions into the chat so we can consult our panel. All right, we've got responses rolling in. So thank you everybody for taking the time to do that. We'll leave this up for just a couple more minutes. I hope the weather's gonna be good this weekend. That's the main, my main concern right now. I haven't seen the forecast, but I just hope we have a clear, pretty day on Sunday. So Ray, I think a question, this is probably a question for you. Um, Kelly wants to know if this presentation will be available online. Um, if we have per permission from um, Sarah to do so with her presentation, we can, we can do that. If she's okay with that. We can combine them into in one one PDF. I don't have any problem with that. Great. We also recorded the session today, and we were planning to send that link out to everybody who registered. If again, if our presenters are all right with doing so. Yeah. Okay. That works. 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. So thanks everybody for taking time for that. And it looks like there's some well wishes in the chat box, but I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Lots of thank yous to our panelists. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us this evening and thanks Thanks to the presenters too and moderators, greatly appreciate it. My pleasure to be here, Ray. Oh, we did get one late breaking question here. Um, let's see, Char uh, Charles wants to know how to, for a first timer, um, a how-to video for scalloping. So how deep do you look? And what do you look for? Well, I, I can take a crack at it. I've been scalloping three times already this summer. Um, and in our area of the state, we, we scallop in water that's about three to four feet deep. And I'm, I've mostly gone scalloping in Taylor County. So that's a, a good depth profile to start at. And um, you want to look for those blue eyes shining and then also, um, you know, they're, they're pretty camouflaged, but you'll start to get a search image for them and they, they will start to really pop out to you. Sometimes even if you scare them enough as you swim over them, they may swim over top of the seagrass, but normally they're going to be nestled down in and they, they also can often be found in areas where there's a mix of seagrass species or even clumps of macroalgae or edge, sort of anything that's sort of a patchy seagrass habitat, I tend to have more luck finding scallops in those types of areas. But it may vary in St. Jove. I don't know if there's some more local guidance that any of well, you I, guys want to give. I can respond to that a little bit. And I agree with Lisa there in the in the text box. Yeah, three or four foot deep probably is the is the, is the depth that you'll really find in St. Joe Bay. Last year, um, gosh, I found so many that were in sandier areas um, rather than seagrass. I mean, they were close to, you know, seagrass areas, but I found probably just as many in some of the sandier areas um, that, as I did in the thicker, lush seagrass areas last year. And I don't know really what, what, you know, is the driving factor behind that, but um, I thought that was kind of odd last year. But yeah, three to four foot depth. Yeah. St. Joe Bay is really shallow for most of it, unless you get to the very end of the peninsula. You know, there, there are a couple of deep spots in the bay, but for the most part, where you're going to go scalloping, yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty shallow. All right, I've got 7.04 on my, on my watch. Um, if we don't have any more questions, we'll wrap things up for the evening. Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank the speakers and the moderators. This was great. I really appreciate it. And I uh, just want to wish everybody a ha happy scalloping season. Thanks, everybody. Everybody stay safe.